funny philosophy. Well, this is going to be pretty heavy one. The left. As in the left wing. I'll have to talk for 20 minutes to. Because that's the paradigm that I created with this system. Um, the left. History of the left. The left is a term in uh, political language and. What does the left represent now, I suppose? Essentially, I will be talking about this philosophy series. I apologise for the. I spilled a bit of food on me earlier on. Um, where does the term left originate from? It, um, as far as I remember, it roots back from the French Revolution. The other idea of the French, the left, left and the right wing. Forces. I'm pretty sure it comes from there. Um, what do people think of often when they think uh, when someone says I'm left wing? What do people think? They often think um, for a lot of people that means communist. Some people it means an anarchist, uh, and for us it could mean liberal in terms of how uh, you know, attitudes, social attitudes. Uh, sometimes matters of the state as well, but communism and anarchism are usually associated with the far left and often violently oppose fascism. Fascism being corporate control and power of the state authoritarian regimes. Authoritarianism uh, occurs between the left and the right, of course, I think it's fair. Um, Because it's totalitarianism, the history of totalitarianism is really well covered in Animal Farm and Night in It Four, which is obvious to anybody of a certain age. But um, Night in Animal Farm really is a parody of um, Stalin's Russia and the revolution as well. So that's worth reading. Um, Night in It Four is not a book I've read, actually. I've read Animal Farm, but I've never read Night in It Four. 1984. Um, 1984 covers the life of Winston Smith, who's a mid-level government bureaucrat, basically in a society which has a governing party called INSOC, which stands for English Socialism. It's written by George Orwell, and it describes how Winston Smith starts to question his. Uh, question his role in that society and the society that he's been brought up and conditioned in against um, Big Brother. Basically everyone's monitored, they, they see dystopia where um, what else they say uh, it's, it's, it's like a lot of socialist societies it preaches equality but there's actually still an authoritarian power structure now, let me just dive further into this in terms of my own beliefs. I define myself as an, uh, currently, as an anarchist. Anarchist, libertarian, socialist, really. What that really means is libertarian socialism is really the classic form of anarchism as espoused by people like Noam Chomsky, for example. So it's the idea of a bottom-up socialism, basically. So bottom upwards, i.e. people's control of their own environments, workplaces, democratically owned. Um, not authoritarian, where people are forced into collectivization and such, which is what um, certainly Marxist-Leninism became in pretty much every attempt at trying to pull off that dictation of the proletariat, which is just a it's just a such a stupid phrase that it even exists, dictatorship of the proletariat. If you view the, well that's another thing in socialism, Marxism, you have, um, 
well, I mean, there is a class system, obviously, but they, the class system in Marxist socialism is called, well, you have proletariats who are the working classes, basically, essentially, bourgeoisie, middle class, kind of like capitalist class as well. So the proletariat make the makers and the producers of uh, goods, labor, labor, their labor time. Uh, bourgeoisie are kind of the ind administrative intelligence here, I suppose. If you want to put, it, depending on where you put it in context and time, capitalist class just the owners of factories and mills. So, in terms of how much Marxist analysis actually, you know, is actually relevant to today, I'd say less so. Um, Marx can Marx is still a relevant thinker. Marx is still relevant to our society, but in a very different way. I think no, I'm just going to go dive more into my own philosophies now. But Marx is relevant in terms of Marx is still relevant in terms of that we have a class system. Still, it's more subtle now. Um, arguably, we have like a technocratic class, so it's essentially. Well, this relates somewhat to an idea I wrote about quite a while ago, which was uh, I used to maintain a blog on uh, basically called Exploring Ideas of Singularity, Post-Humanism, Post-Humanist, Transhumanist um, Socialism, which was basically when once technology gets to the point where we can start you know, medical advances and medical advances and we advance our own technology to the point where by we can <clears throat> you know like improve the human condition for those who are suffering then it's only fair that like we have had in the kind of the World War Two post-war government, you have like a national health service, and an, an idea that is very prevalent in the left is the idea of uh, global coverage. Oh, global coverage. Well, it can't be in the ideal that we global, but like a medical uh, medicine that covers everybody. Basically, that's often a kind of bugbear on the left is you know, um, public health care. Basically, that's mostly developed out of the welfare state. Most of that. Boost that idea comes from my country, which is England or Britain, Britain really, Slow Union of um, yeah, playing into the national insurance, which is a tax on your income, and then from that everybody kind of benefits from the medical care, and it works in the UK. It's not perfect. What system is perfect in government? But it works. It helps people get through shit. I mean, I've been through shit. Help me through shit. It works. I mean, America uh, has kind of strange history of the left, and I'll just go into that because it seems appropriate. So, America um, has had like socialist movements, thinking of uh, IWW, um, what's that guy's name? Oh, Oh, not Bernie Sanders, but Eugene Hobbs, Eugene Dobbs, you trade union organizer. Um, lots of a kind of working class organization, grassroots organizations, but it's often been crushed in the US by. Well, I mean, the US is a much larger country, continent, really. So it is more complicated. Sanders was really the last hope, I think, for the, well, for the last hope, there will be a new hope, but the hope, obviously, in the last election cycle of America. And then you ended up, well, fortunately, with what you've got, which in Donald Trump, even um, Cornel West is calling him a neo-fascist. Now, of course, there will be a collective side by anyone watching this use, so that all, and he's calling Trump a, a Nazi. It's quite obvious. I don't think I wouldn't even give him the courtesy of calling him a Nazi. Not because, not in the sense that I curtsy Nazis. Obviously, I fucking hate Nazis, but in the sense that 
he isn't that Machiavellian, he isn't that cunning. Something well we often mentioned about Hitler is that he was a Machiavellian character. Very Machiavellian, very cunning, very uh, well, political mastermind really. Um, and obviously I have no time for Hitler, I'm, you know, for a start my, my grandfather was in the war, the uh, engineer in the RAF, no time for Hitler, I hate fascism with every core of my, the fibre of my being, I despise fascists, I despise fascism. Fascism as um, uh, there's an interesting book actually read on this subject, The Losing Guterou. This is an anti psychiatry book, but it's also anti verse within it's about I touched on fascism. I don't have to go into a different subject now, but The Losing Guterro touched upon the idea of uh, how <sighs> fascism is just basically reverts back to a kind of anality and a desire to hyper control everything every aspect of your life and when you think about that like deeply you can't control every aspect of your life life by definition is chaotic this is why liberty comes into the socialism because I mean, libertarianism is off, is now thought of as a you know, kind of wild west free market ideal in America, but it's the real roots of libertarianism at the left. Whether it be in uh, <coughs> um, Franco, you know, Spanish War, Spanish, Spanish Civil War, that was essentially a conflict of you know, authority versus liberty uh, what else I need to cover so I've covered uh, I'll go into let's just go into the really looming dark thing on the horizon the USSR and let's just try to dive into it February October revolution all the rest of it so February revolution was uh, like a failed revolution October revolution um, the Bolsheviks seized power, um, and they create this from the provisional government, and they create the first inverted commas workers state. The idea, Lenin's slogan was all power to the Soviets. Now the Soviets were the work, working councils, which had formed prior to the revolution. Trading uh, councils of working men and women in labour, free you know, free you know labour unions basically. But there was a conflict, obviously the whites and the reds, the counter revolutionary forces versus the red guards, led by Trotsky primarily. And um, but what's happened quite rapidly is that obviously that led to a lot of resource. Uh, they're not being involved. Resources are cut off. Russia was cut off from resources. First World War was happening. Uh, not long after. Um, Russia came out of the war. Um, and yeah, Lenin had a stroke. And then Trotsky was supposed to take over, I think, I believe, historically. And then Stalin got into power. Well, Stalin was a, a ruffian of years of just a real violent character, really, if you look at his past. And that just reflected on and on in his rule. He was a bloody autocrat. Um, there was the Second World War, of course, which um, Russians lost many, 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 many lives during that war, during the conflict. And that probably, I think, in terms of the Russian populace, changed their perception of Stalin. It's probably seen in a similar way to Churchill is by British people in some respects. Like, I respect Churchill as a British person. I mean, I don't like the Tory party, but I respect Churchill as a war leader. Because 
he kept people going with his oratory skills during the Second World War, which is the worst conflict the Earth's ever had, really. So, I imagine some Russians probably see it in a similar way. I'm not, in the, I'm not excusing Stalin. I'm just saying that's probably the way it's seen, I guess, across east of here. Um, so yeah, what else? Got five minutes left. Uh, Anarcho-communism. Um, if that's the anarchistic form of communism, more fit in theory. Um, I read. I've just read a book actually on queer anarchism. Or well, I've been reading extracts from that which is about the intersection between queer theory and anarchism. Um, so we read some extracts in that about, well, obviously primarily there's a lot of it's dealing with sexuality and um, it deals with what is so-called heteronormative, well not so-called heteronormative, but heteronormative, which is a phrase used in uh, modern queer theory, I think. Heteronormativism, uh, but basically, I'll go into that actually. So basically, anarchists have often questioned the um, validity of traditional, you know, marriage, of the, the institution of marriage. What can that mean? Free love is a concept that's existed in the left for a while. Can be interpreted in many. It could be either the free enterprise of men and women to work together, or it could mean, you know. It's, I mean, it's that's a complicated question, I suppose. Um, what else can I cover? So I've covered a bit. Of the left now. Where is the left now? Um, kind of. We're gaining strength, I think, in some ways, but also fragmented in others. So, well, three minutes. This will be quick. So, I mean, the left has always been about. International, international people internationally working together on common causes and common concerns, and the left still does that. But the problem that it's been having, obviously, has been because of the the right. It's basically got the machines of culture, I suppose, essentially. In terms of the media, that's what I mean. The right predominantly controls the media. Well, that doesn't mean you just the left should just go in and pff, infiltrate any of left wing whatever, but left wing propaganda or journalism. But um, I mean, that's why journalism exists, really. And why it should always exist, because if the freedom to write freedom, of, well, let's tie this up really nicely. The freedom to write two plus two equals four is an essential freedom to keep free for every thinking individual. In every country on this planet, because if you cannot write two plus two equals four, and then you, and people of you are forced to say that it equals five, then we live in a world that's inverted on itself and gone mad, insane, literally an insane world, an insane society, a society of just. You have to be able to call a spoon a spoon in any society, and if you can't call a spoon a spoon in the society, then why create the spoon in the first place? Why create the spoon in the first place if you can't call it a spoon? <laughs> uh, a weird major reference, that really. Um, there is no spoon. Um, So I'll end this one on a joke. In Soviet Russia, math counts you. But count yourself two, two, equal four. <laughs>